All right, good evening, guys. Um, first of a, a double whammy session tonight. We've got this last mentoring session, then our, our last revision session um, later on. Uh, I can see you've all been having a, a, a bit of a, a chat there. Um, can, can I just confirm, as usual, that you can see me and hear me all right? Yeah, OK, good. A um, <laughs> bit worried about the, concern, the comment there. Sam was it saying, I probably need another month to be ready. Sadly, um, Sam, you don't have another month. Uh, I, seem to whoops, I seem to recall that the, um, the exam is actually next week, isn't it? In fact, very early next week. Um, all right. Uh, clearly, you've all been doing... Um, a fair amount of, of work, which is great. Um, how can I help with this sort of half hour in terms of dealing with any queries that have arisen during your uh, revision studies? Some of the earlier comments have gone off the top of my screen now, so I don't know what I missed before I came in, uh, having just rushed across here from lecturing in another centre during the day. So. Anybody care to start? Please give us a guide to exam time management. Well, yeah. I mean, very simply, it's a case of, you know, you know that you've got 100 marks on offer and you've got three hours to get them. So you don't need to be Einstein to know that it's 1.8 minutes per mark. So the very, very important thing as regards time management, and this applies on all um, all papers, not just auditing. You've got to manage your time not just between questions but between requirements within questions. So you look at the marks for a given requirement and you either multiply by 1.8 or personally, um, mental arithmetic, you know, much easier, I just double the marks, knock off 10%, same effect. Um, and it's very, very important, guys, that you, know, you do stick to your time. If the time is up, finished or not, you must leave it. All right? That's why before you start putting down your final answer, I know some of you maybe are not going to uh, actually put down a plan in your answer book, um, but whatever your approach is going to be, you've got to make sure that when the time is up, you leave it, finished or not. If you're not finished and you think uh, you could give more time, add something of value to your answer, well, the only thing you've got plenty of in the exam room, remember, is paper. So leave some space in case you make up time elsewhere and you can come back to it. Um, but you must make sure that uh, you, as I say, stick rigidly to your time management. What I used to do when I was doing exams, um, before I started answering a question requirement, I'd work out the time I'd got. I know in exam centres there's normally a big digital clock or something which is on display for the benefit of all students, maybe a number of them in your exam hall. But I always used to keep my, um, my own watch on the desk in front of me. I would see what the time was when I started, and I would write down on the question paper, I would write down my finish time. And when I hit that, I would leave it. Um, I say, if I thought I might have time to come back, I'd leave space, just in case. Uh, provided you can get something down, all of the question requirements, that's going to be good exam technique. Um, the other thing which I've spoken to you about previously, is in terms of time management, to try and ease the pressure on yourself a bit, you stay in control. Have your strategy in the order in which you're going to answer the questions. My recommendation, you may recall, is choose your two, during the 15 minutes reading and planning time, choose your two favourite optional questions, start with one of those, then get the two compulsory high mark questions out of the way, finish with an optional question so that it's one you've chosen, it's one that you're happy with, so that you know, even if you should be short of time, you can finish quickly. 
Uh, but sticking to time uh, allocation, as indicated by the marks, is very, very important. Combined with that, of course, look at the verbs used by the examiner, look at the marks, set yourself a realistic target, how many ideas do I need to come up with? If you just keep writing songs, you can keep writing, that's when you're in danger of overrunning your time management. Um, analytical procedures does not always mean we have to do ratios, etc. right. Um, well, yeah, ratios as part, using accounting ratios as part of analytical procedures. Uh, it, it is an important part of it. Um, your second comment there, Nelly, um, yeah, you've got to, whatever we're talking about in terms of audit evidence and using analytical procedures is, of course, a means of gathering audit evidence, we have to recognise that it can and perhaps should come from a variety of sources. Some of the evidence that we look to obtain may be direct, some may be indirect, some may be internal, some may be external. You're never going to base your audit conclusion on any, any element of the audit, perhaps on a single piece of audit evidence, but rather on a combination of them. And yeah, it's always good if you can get a, a mix of different sources. So certainly, as well as comparing with previous year's results for that individual client, yeah, if they are available, compare with any industry statistics, as in fact you've um, suggested. Um, so compare with other businesses, compare with uh, prior years. Right, what else we've got coming in here? As for you're saying you still find procedures and evidence um, difficult. That's uh, a little bit um, vague in terms of, of knowing what it is that's causing the, uh, the difficulty. With regard to procedures, first of all, I'd say if you're asked for procedures, as clearly we frequently are, um, although not as often as we used to be at F8, then remember, as with all your answers, you mustn't be too vague. If you're going to recommend a procedure, then your recommendation must both indicate what the procedure is, but to give yourself a chance of getting all of the marks on offer for that point, you've got to give some indication also of why you're carrying out that procedure. Uh, in terms of coming up with ideas for procedures, um, go back to F8 days and remember, you know, think in terms of different financial statement assertions because that, I think, can help lead you to coming up with the right sort of uh, procedures. If you get, as we often do in question one, where we've one of the requirements, we've got to evaluate risks. Um, and then another requirement is to recommend procedures. The procedures are likely to be risk areas. But do be careful, as always, read the question carefully. Sometimes those requirements for procedures are very, very specific. So if you just come up with general procedures, whilst you may be factually correct, um, then uh, if it's not relevant to that question, it's not going to get you marks. Generally, in terms of audit evidence, remember you've got to get sufficient appropriate evidence. Appropriate evidence breaks down into relevant, reliable evidence. Uh, and again, there is a link with the uh, procedures. Watch out for the question requirement, which, um, or the yeah, the question re re requirement, which might be in the email from a partner. Um, is that being specific? Is he specifically asking you, is it sufficient or is it relevant or is it reliable? Um, Nedrama, you're saying please explain topics on minor issues that are not covered in uh, revision. <laughs> um, well, 
it's a, it's a difficult um, one. That it's surprising with the various questions we've looked at already, and we're still going to touch on later this evening. We've actually touched on most of the uh, key elements of um, the, the, the syllabus. Um, at this stage, with the exam being, what is it, on Monday, we're now Friday evening, um, I wouldn't worry about minor issues. That's my advice. Um, if something unusual perhaps comes up, you think, ooh, what's that? If you're thinking that all around the world in different exam centres, other people will be making or feeling the same way. Um, with just a couple of days to go, uh, you, you don't want to be worrying uh, about things. So we've covered all the major topics. If something which is, should we say, a little bit on the fringe of the syllabus comes up and you're not sure about it, don't ignore it. Make an intelligent guess. Remember, they don't negative mark. So you've got, by making an intelligent guess, and you clearly are all intelligent people, otherwise you wouldn't have got this far. You wouldn't have got as far as P7. Um, if you make an intelligent guess, um, you've got a chance of picking up a couple of uh, marks. If you get it wrong, they don't negative mark. But don't ignore any requirements, because should you end up being borderline, that can influence your result. Um, Should we attempt compulsory questions first or optional ones? I think I've already answered that question. My, it's a personal choice and it must be your personal choice. Mine would be start with an optional, then get the two big ones, the two compulsory questions out of the way, finish with an optional. Then right at the beginning, when you need to settle down, you're in control. You've chosen the question you want to answer. Right at the end, when you're feeling a bit tired, a bit pressured, by time perhaps, you're in control uh, because it's a question that you've chosen. Will we get marked for things that are not in the answer requirement? Are you making a relevant point? Just looking at the answer to the past paper may not be there, but my mock, I had marks for making. A relevant point. Well, yeah, <laughs> Jackie, if it's relevant, um, and it is answering the question, it will get marks. If it's not answering the question, um, then it can't be relevant. So, no, you won't get marks for it. Um, last, where are we? I'm trying to keep track of these. Um, Could you, I please explain what points to look for and eclipses, especially on illustrate um, requirement? Well, what you've got to, to look for in analytical procedures generally uh, in the real world, and therefore should of course be no different in the exam room, is remember analytical procedures, you're using these um, and they can help you to identify um, those areas where perhaps you've got an unexpected change which clearly would require investiga further investigation. Equally, areas where you expect a change and it's not materialised, again, that is going to uh, require investigation. Do be prepared if, as we have noted the trend for giving us a lot of the information and scenarios as financial statement extracts uh, as opposed to just narrative uh, description. If you've come across anything which suggests that some of the figures in the given draft financial statement extract would need amending, then be prepared when you're doing your analytical procedures and, and um, discussing this in, in your answers to show that you've realised that you know, for example, if 
you've got something if you've reviewed the financial statements and you think, hang on a minute, they've got something there in non-current liabilities which should be in current liabilities. Well, be prepared to adjust your um, answer and instead of doing the textbook calculation of the current ratio, of the, the quick ratio, adjust the figures before you do the calculation. That way you will sh clearly show um, the examiner that you've been actively and positively using the information provided and thinking carefully about what you're doing. Um, last minute questions to practice, please. Well, if um, you've worked all of the questions that I've recommended as homework as well as the ones we've covered in, in class, then I would always prioritise by any questions that, working back, that you've not attempted from the most recent exams, which of course starts with uh, the June paper. Um, can I please explain what an assurance engagement is in the simplest terms? Um, well, it's where the accountant is looking to add some credibility to something which another person is responsible for preparing. So essentially as an assurance provider we are there as an independent expert to lend credibility. If you think of the essential elements of any assurance engagement uh, then you've always got to make sure that you have got for the subject matter a recognised criteria by reference to which it's going to be uh, prepared, that you've got the three people involved, the practitioner, the responsible party, the intended user. Um, you must be able to have a means of obtaining evidence in relation to the subject matter in order that you can provide whatever level of assurance it's going to be. Um, unless you're doing full audit procedures, remember where with that you can give positive high level assurance. If you're giving um, lower level assurance, because it's not a full audit, then it's not positive, it's negative assurance. Um, right. Uh, besides the audit report, technical article, and any other article you suggest we should go through? Well, you may recall the very beginning, the start of the re sort of lecturing phase. I said, if you've not been reading them before because you weren't a previously a P7 student, big backlog to catch up on. A um, bit late if you haven't been reading them now, um, but concentrate on the, the most recent ones if you still haven't got round to that yet. Um, you don't really want to be looking over the last couple of days to get new stuff into your knowledge database though. It, you've got to make the best at this stage of what you've got. Do we have to use AEIOU? Word of warning I've given you before. By all means, I as a student and still as a tutor make use of mnemonics uh, to help me remember things just as you've got to, to learn and remember things. For goodness sake, don't obviously be seen to make use of a mnemonic in the way you put your answer together. We've seen the examiner criticising people for obviously using mnemonics in their answers, her concern being that they're not really thinking about the specific issue in front of them, they're just trotting out a standard approach, possibly to a non-standard situation. So do be careful there. Um, What else have we? Some of them are going through too quickly. Um,
sorry, I'm just trying to see what's... Um, <coughs> yeah, issues like auditing accounting experts that in the financial and fair values are very often these days. Can you elaborate, please? Um, yeah, one of the things I would say on this, I think something which um, sometimes puts a lot of students off when they're working, as you obviously have been doing, which is what you need to be doing. Um, when, remember, you are, you've worked a past exam question, you then perhaps look at a, an answer, look at the examiner's answer in particular. As she has said, as all examiners say, remember, those examiner's answers are provided as much as anything, just as you're using them now, as um, a future, a source of learning materials for future students. Um, and typically, therefore, they are much longer and more detailed than what we're expected, what you're expected to produce in the time pressure conditions of the uh, exam room. A lot of the examiner's answers um, you couldn't even copy out in the time available, let alone uh, think them up first. Um, so it always gives more points than you need. Um, in order to get full marks, let alone a safe pass mark. I cannot stress enough to you, in terms of your exam technique, don't be over ambitious. Look at the marks, look at the verb, and essentially if you've got a, a verb being used in an exam question requirement, like list or state or recommend, and that is the only verb the examiner has used, then one idea, one sentence should get you that mark. If she uses as the verb or verbs in the requirement, if she says identify but adds to it and explain, um, or she says evaluate or comment on or discuss, then we know, or we should do by this stage, she's expecting a bit more detail in the answer. And therefore, you know, you've probably got to have not just a single, perhaps relatively short sentence, you're going to be looking for a couple of sentences to, um, to get the marks in, in the bag with that higher level verb being used in the um, requirement. Current issues, audit report, whoops. Is it possible to have a full optional question on that? What requirements might be asked? Uh, it's possible, given that the optional questions are now in total going to be 20 marks each. Um, never say never, but I'd be surprised if we got the full 20 marks on that. I think if it's question five, not the traditional home of the audit report question, you might, I think, you're more likely to get it broken down um, between uh, the, the traditional you know, practical uh, application of um, audit report implications and then a separate um, discussion element asking for your views on uh, the proposed amendments to the audit report. Things like, you know, putting the opinion paragraph first. Um, possibly by having, asking for auditors as a matter of routine to give commentary uh, on significant issues that have arisen during the course of the audit, perhaps therefore doing away with you know, the emphasis of matter paragraph, the other matter paragraph. Greater emphasis or you know, more detail perhaps given in looking to explain, to bridge the expectation gap of um, the director's responsibilities, the auditor's responsibilities. Um, yeah, good to see you being supportive. Yeah, nerves in themselves in the exam are not a bad thing. They help to get the adrenaline going. Provided you keep them under control, they're a good thing. Uh, you'll keep them under control. Um, 
if you remain in control. That's why my strategy is start with a question you've um, chosen. And somebody said there, you've got to go into that exam room with a positive attitude. Sadly, some of you I know have been there before and not got through. Don't be defeatist. The important part of exam techniques is, OK, didn't work last time, but it's going to work uh, this time. Um, if the exam asks for, let's say, 10 business risk, I can't think it would ever ask for 10, but you never know, and you give 12, and 10 out of the 12 correct, will you get the marks or only for the first 10 you write? Um, they've actually said that if, you, if they specify the number of risks, let's use that as the example, and you give more, that they will actually look at them all and award the marks to the best ones. Um, <coughs> nevertheless, <coughs> my strong advice to students is, if the question is specific in terms of the number of procedures, risks, whatever it may be, the question says four, stick to four. Think about it before you start writing on those four and make sure you're not in any danger of being a little bit repetitious with variations on the theme. Four good separate ideas and you'll get, if not full marks, you'll get a safe pass mark. You might be able to think of 10. The trouble is, if you go for 10, almost certainly you're going to mess up your time management, something which we started talking about this evening. So I don't advise it. Stick to the specific number in the question. Uh, I've missed something somewhere. Huh? How a basis of disclaimer looks like. Well, whatever modification through qualification you're going to give in the audit report, um, remember, with the present format of the report, there should be a separate paragraph in which you detail, quantifying if possible, the circumstances which are leading you in the next paragraph to give a qualified opinion. If you're giving a disclaimer of opinion, remember that is because you've not been able to obtain sufficient appropriate um, evidence. So you're going to have to spell it out. You're probably not um, going to be able to necessarily quantify this because you're not being able to get sufficient appropriate evidence. But you've got to explain to the shareholders and the other potential users why you've not been able to obtain um, that evidence. If you regard this as being pervasive, having had that basis of disclaimer, then in the disclaimer of opinion paragraph, you've got to refer back to the previous paragraph and point out that because of the significance of the matter referred to above, we are unable to form an opinion as to whether or not the financial statements give a true and fair view. Remember, you might still be able to say that in other respects they've been properly prepared in accordance with whatever uh, the local reporting requirement may be, Commercial Code, Companies Act or whatever. I'm not sure, have I, is it Gloria that's like this? Are we okay on that one now then? Um, right, well we've, actually I think um, that's probably just pretty much our, our, our 30 minutes up. Um, so short break here hope that's helped and i'll be back here six o'clock local uk time okay
so back at six.